Hi! For today's Think for a Change video, I'm going to be responding to some of the comments that were posted on my last video about anti-Asian racism. And in particular, I want to address those comments that people had um, that expressed a kind of frustration or a disagreement with the examples and the points that I was making about forms of racism, uh, specifically those that target Asian people, and those, the idea of those who said, like, this isn't racism, or questions of just how is this racism, or frustration of, like, now we're just going to be so politically correct that everything has to be racist. So those are the people that I want to be referring to um, with this next video. Um, and the way that I'm going to respond to this is by using a concept that comes out of this book, The Racial Contract by Charles Mills. This was written in 1997. It is a fabulous book. I highly suggest that you read it. It's like a hundred and something pages, short, accessible, and it packs a punch. So, in the racial contract, um, Charles Mills gives us a concept called an epistemology of ignorance. Epistemology is just a word that refers to the study of belief or knowledge. And an epistemology of ignorance could be something like the study of ignorance, something that we don't know, um, and like the why we don't know certain things. Or it could also be um, an epistemology of, that is, consisting in ignorance. And it's this latter use uh, that Charles Mills picks up for his book in The Racial Contract. Uh, so epistemology of ignorance in this way becomes an entire system of thought, that is an epistemology, a whole structure of knowledge and belief that consists in the production and maintenance of ignorance. Though I don't have time to go into a full discussion of his argument of the racial contract, um, or what that really refers to, the main idea that he says on the very first page of the introduction is that white supremacy is the unnamed political system that has made the modern world what it is today. So he's talking about global white supremacy as being a political economic uh, system that also has epistemological qualities to it moral dimensions and aesthetic dimensions that make it what it is today. Um, and he uses the notion of the racial contract as a way to explain how global white supremacy has come about. And the racial contract is not just a metaphorical thing, but also a literal contract. It is like the signing in agreement of white people um, that makes them beneficiaries of a sort of a arrangement of how things are going to be working in the world. I know I'm being vague. But most crucially is that the racial contract sets up white people and non-white people, where white people are the signatories of the contract and non-whites are excluded from its terms completely. <clears throat> this is also important because we're not just talking about whites and blacks or uh, in race in that way, but um, he, Charles Mills gives us a distinction of what it means when he's referring to whiteness. On one hand, there's whiteness with a lowercase w that is a phenotypical or racial classification, like white-skinned people, um, what you might initially first think of when you hear white people, um, or whiteness. But there's another part of whiteness, which is capital W whiteness. It's the sort of attitude or perspective that is necessary and required for the racial contract. It shows a political commitment to global white supremacy, and more importantly, whiteness no longer is just referring to a color, like the color of someone's skin, but a set of power relationships. <clears throat> so, um, in that sense, someone posted a comment on my last video that was like, anti-racism equals anti-white. And though th I think they were using that as an attack against my views that I was putting forth, in a sense, they're right when we're talking with racial contract terms or with Charles Mills that, yeah, anti-racism is anti-whiteness because whiteness is now referring to forms of domination. It doesn't have to be just white people, just whiteness is a form of a systematic way of viewing and thinking domination and oppressive relationships. So I'll just um, now read from the book so you can get an idea of how Charles Mills talks about an epistemology of ignorance. He says, for the racial contract, things are necessarily more complicated. The requirements of objective cognition, factual and moral, in a racial polity are in a sense more demanding in that officially sanctioned reality is divergent from actual reality. So here it could be said, one has an agreement to misinterpret the world. 
one has to learn to see the world wrongly, but with the assurance that this set of mistaken perceptions will be validated by white epistemic authority, whether religious or secular. So what that means is that you sign the contract by misperceiving, learning to misinterpret the world around you, but with the assurance that there will be others who think this with you as well. So textbooks, um, political leaders, whatever they teach you in school, whatever your parents say, whatever, there will be explanations that are in accordance with your misinterpretation of the world, so you won't be a lone duck out there. Thus an effect on matters related to race, the racial contract prescribes for its signatories an inverted epistemology, an epistemology of ignorance. A particular pattern of localized and global cognitive dysfunctions, which are importantly psychologically and socially functional, producing the ironic outcome that whites will in general be unable to understand the world they themselves have created. Part of what it means to be constructed as white, or to achieve whiteness with a capital W, is a cognitive model that precludes self-transparency and genuine understanding of social realities. So, this means that there will be um, <clears throat> a sort of virtual world, invented Africa's, invented Americas, with a f correspondingly fabricated population, countries that never were, inhabited by people who never were, but all these virtual realities um, attain a virtual reality through their existence by way of traveler's tales, folk myth, popular and highbrow fiction, colonial reports, scholarly theory, Hollywood cinema, living on in the white imagination, and determinedly opposed on their alarmed real-life counterparts. So you have a sort of mythological, this is the cultural assumption or the icons and the stereotypes about who these people are in other parts of the world or in other neighborhoods. And then that go gets carried on and perpetuated by things like uh, movies or television or the way that everybody else talks about things. So one could say then, as a general rule, that white misunderstanding, misrepresentation, evasion, and self-deception on matters related to race are among the most pervasive mental phenomena of the past few hundred years. A cognitive and moral economy psychically required for conquest, colonization, and enslavement. And these phenomena are in no way accidental, but prescribed by the terms of the racial contract, which requires a certain schedule of structured blindness and opacities in order to establish and maintain the white polity. <clears throat> so the idea here is that an epistemology of ignorance, um, a systematic misperception or misinterpretation of the world, is going to serve a political, psychological, um, and uh, sorry, it's going to serve a particular psychological and political function by precluding the ability for us to actually see reality as it is. That's so that things like colonization, enslavement, domination, oppression, exploitation, imperialism can continue on without being checked and thus the status quo, especially those who are privileged by the terms of the contracts, the whites with a capital W and sometimes often with white skin, they will be able to maintain their dominant status. <clears throat> um, here's an example. I'll, I think I have time for one example to explain this. One of the consequences of the racial contract or the epistemology of ignorance is a sort of historical amnesia where we forget how things came to be, like forget all of those practices that have made it such that white European or Anglo-American people have become some of the most powerful people in the world over the past couple of hundred years. It didn't just happen as a miracle or by the grace of God or they're just so reasonable, but there have been systems and practices that have been put in place to put them in those powerful positions and maintain their status there. Um, but another consequence of this epistemology of ignorance is a sort of greater value attached to white life versus non-white life. And when we couple that with a historical amnesia, here's an example. I taught this book in a class uh, last semester, and my students, when we got to discussions of the Jewish Holocaust, they said, it's not that we care about the Jewish Holocaust because here you have an example of Europeans being murdered in mass numbers. Um, as opposed to other examples of massacres or genocide. The reason why we know so much more about the Holocaust and think of the Jewish Holocaust as the greatest travesty of the 20th century or all of human history is because, again, not that it's Europeans who are being murdered here, but because it's happened in the 20th century with World War II, huge historical event, 
um, America was involved. We have videos and pictures so we can really see it. And then finally, Hitler was really efficient at killing people. So thus, all of these reasons make it that the Jewish Holocaust comes to our mind. You might even say there's museums, we learn about it in school, and all of those are also reasons to raise a flag and get us thinking why there are museums, <laughs> why do we learn about school and not other things. So they say it's not an issue of race, it's a nation, it's an issue of all these other little factors. I was shocked because after the majority of my students go to great lengths to defend that this is not a racial issue, um, I said, well, you want World War II, uh, recent history with American involvement, videos and pictures, and you want efficiency of killing people, we dropped atomic bombs, two of them, on Japan in World War II. And this isn't a racial issue because no one was able to come up with their own counterpoint to the sort of defense that my students were giving of the Jewish Holocaust. This isn't to devalue the Jewish Holocaust, but only to make the point that people could not even, they were, people in my students or in my class were unable to come up with this example to think of it. And atomic bombs are a big deal. Um, so, but the epistemology of ignorance is a helpful concept, not just for talking about issues of race. I haven't notably explicitly stated that I'm using this concept, but in my other videos it's come up too. So there's an epistemology of ignorance, I think, at work in um, respect to how we understand sexual violence and sexual abuse. So in the rape scripts video that I have, that's what's uh, informing my analysis. Similarly, in the Where Are the Gay Girls video, there's an epistemology of ignorance, I would say, at work in terms of how we view homophobia that limits our ability to adequately respond to homophobia and how it affects those who are lesbian, bisexual, or transgendered. And so finally then, what I'm saying with the video about anti-Asian racism is that there's an epistemology of ignorance at work which makes it so that many people, especially white people, or the people with the capital W whiteness, are unable to appreciate how racism is operating and thus it serves a purpose because it makes it impossible for us to adequately resist and challenge racism as it happens in the world. So I think this is a helpful concept, an epistemology of ignorance. I hope that you can continue thinking about it because it applies to lots of different stuff. Um, and pick up the book, read it if you can. Finally, before I go, I want to say I also very much appreciate the comments that people have been posting on the videos. I really am grateful for the ways that you are posting a response and then other people are engaging with one another on those responses too. I can't personally respond to all of your points and I know these videos are going to be incomplete because they have to be short, but thank you for taking seriously these ideas, for thinking them through, and for engaging one another. That's the way that this is going to work. It's my hope that we can have these sort of conversations and continue thinking through these issues with one another. So. Thank you for watching, keep up the good work, and hopefully we can all think for a change. <laughs>